Um, let me read a scripture to you, and then I'm going to let you be seated. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And verse number 4. It's a simple verse. This is the probably the most uh, prominent verse for the Jewish, for Judaism, Jewish religion. This is probably the most prominent verse that they use in their Bible, which is the Old Testament. The Jews and the Christians share their view that the Old Testament is the Word of God. Of course, we know the New Testament is too, but the Judaism wouldn't share that belief. But this is, I would say, probably without a doubt, they would say this is the most prominent verse in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And he goes on in our language today to say, if you don't get anything else, get that. And so this is why they make that such a prominent part. But it's a prominent part of the whole Bible. We, if we just took time to read all the other scriptures which reiterate that in one form or another, we would take, would take a long time because there are scores of such scriptures. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I want to preach to you about this a little bit today. Everybody said, in Jesus' name, you may be seated. Amen. Before we do that, however, uh, uh, we also want to say we're happy for all of our guests that are here. And uh, uh, I wasn't here last weekend and what a great time and multiplied numbers of people uh, give me the reports of what a great time we had here but m my part of the we was somewhere else uh, doing a, a fifth anniversary for a preacher a young man out of this church so uh, which becomes responsibility that you do I guess uh, we did uh, as, your church, as the church produces uh, ministers, then you got to continue to stay connected with them. So, but, but what happened here was a great weekend, and then we had a great time Tuesday night, and we're having a great time this morning. Amen. Uh, now, I know <clears throat> that uh, if a congregation of this size, with all of the members and guests and every age, and especially in the present um, economic difficulties and challenges that people are facing uh, all across this nation and even across the world, I know that there are numerous challenges in that area. And then there are uh, challenges in other areas that are resulting from that area. And so marriages get challenged and and stress factors and people lose jobs and all of it. But I want to encourage you this morning. Uh, you know, I could preach about all that, uh, but I want to encourage you this morning by telling you when it finally gets bad enough, you just kind of give it all up and you get better. So how's that for encouragement? So if you're still all stressed, hang on, let it get a little worse, and then you'll just kind of give it all up and you'll feel better. And, and finally, you just say, hey, look, it's out of control. I'm just going to go ahead. So don't uh, knock yourself in the head uh, before you get released because at some point you'll get released if you'll let yourself and just say, look, I've done the best I can. Let's party. Amen. Let's have a good time. Let's love God. Let's love one another. How's that for encouragement? You feel better? Amen. Uh, just don't worry about it. Amen. I mean, you know, if, you, if you've done all you can do, and you can't do any more, then the Bible says when you've done it all, just stand. Just every day, just stand. Just say, hey, I've done the best I can. God sees all that. I am going to stand. Amen. 
don't feel like you got to go off. Oh, God, I can't take this anymore. Just stand. If it all crumbles around you, the world was here before all of that happened. It'll be here after all that happens. So people say, man, you're, you are irresponsible. Whatever. Have a good time. You can't do, I mean, if you're going to lose your house, you're going to live somewhere. Buy a tent or something. Act like you're camping out. Do something. This isn't, doesn't seem to be working very well to encourage some of you. I mean, you know, it could get worse. We could have bad health and we could have, we could, uh, we could be uh, dying of something and some of us are, but it could be worse. You could be dying lost. And so in every situation, we can always turn back and thank God for his goodness to us. Amen. Yeah, and so an attitude of gratitude is the answer. Praise God. And just keep thanking him. Keep thanking him. Anything you don't, you know, the fact that you don't understand something doesn't mean that you should draw a conclusion on it that it's bad. Like God doesn't care. I wouldn't be having this trouble. Why am I having this trouble if God loves me? Has God picked me out? Well, the Bible tells you he hasn't picked you out to pick on you. The Bible tells you he loves you. I can't even tell you why everything happens to you. The Bible lets us know things do happen in this present age that we can't control. They just happen. Amen. So, so let me give you a little secret this morning. When everything's going really bad, a good thing to do is think about God instead of think about yourself. Amen. And begin to magnify him. Amen. And make him bigger in your life. I can't answer all that stuff. I can just tell you, when he gets big enough in your life, all that stuff becomes much smaller. Let's praise him again. Amen. 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 Praise God. So God is good to us. Amen. And I, I thank God that there is a revelation in the Bible about God and we have to have God because we are dependent many years ago someone established the fact that life on earth is categorical and one of the categories that you and I live in is we are dependent if you cut my wrist and I bleed 10 minutes I'll be dead uh, or if somebody shoots you or if you get in a car wreck and it tears you up bad enough you die we are, we are dependent. If there's no more air, we die. If there's no more water, we die. If there's no more food, we die. We are dependent. We also know there's a part of us that's dependent that's invisible. And so we are dependent, and to be dependent means that we are caused, something has caused us to be, and so that makes us have to understand that whatever caused us to be um, has intelligence, which means he's alive, which leads to God, which leads to the many questions about, well, if there is a God, what is God like? And I would simply tell you this morning that for the next few minutes, I'm going to try to explain to you what the Bible tells us God is like and what the Bible tells us about God. Now, in 30 minutes or whatever, I can't give you everything the Bible says about God. And secondly, I certainly don't know, nor does anyone else, everything about God. But that doesn't mean we can't know anything about God. And this particular subject uh, that is even in Scripture called the Godhead um, uh, is a subject that often is not even talked about anymore because people have complicated it to the point that uh, preachers are actually just kind of afraid to even dig in because it's such a big subject. However, um, we're going to look at it this morning, and I want you to ask, your, ask yourself, um, wherever you go to church, how long has it been since you had anybody talk about the Godhead or preach about it, particularly on a particular given service? And so this morning we want to preach about God. I'm not going to preach to you about my problems. I'm going to preach to you about my God. Amen. And, and, uh, and so if we can focus and, and see our God, uh, that's the first step to peace. And the first step to contentment is knowing that there's a God and knowing something about him uh, and that he can be touched. So the first thing that we want to notice about God this morning is that 
uh, there is one God. Can you say amen? And uh, Christianity and Judaism and even Islam uh, all agree that there is only one God. There are many other so-called religious groups that do not agree with that. They would agree that there are many gods. And a lot of the many God, not M-I-N-I, but M-A-N-Y, multiple God ideas originally came from Greece, which had gods that were in human-like form, uh, uh, and, and that would give people an opportunity to be able to try to define or, or understand what God is like. But, and there were many, many gods. And so does Hinduism and many other religions see multiple gods, pagan religions, the worship of, of creation is paganism that also has many gods. The, um, the Apostle Paul addressed this in Acts 17 when he preached on Mars Hill. He said, you have, you have a statue here to many gods, uh, but you have one to the unknown God. And he said, that's the God I want to preach to you about. And so he took that for his text. But the fact is, and our text this morning in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 explains to us that there is one God. And that one God is the uh, ground and source of all things. Everything that is comes from him. Genesis 1.1 in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when he says heavens, that means all that is therein. Stars, moon, planets, uh, space bits, meteors, meteorites, whatever's out there. God created it. If there's little green men with uh, 76 Union gas station balls on the top of their antennas, God created those too. They're not there, but just for some of you that are whacked out in some of that stuff with try to be inclusive today so uh, and so God is God is uh, one there's only one God so what is this God like well the Bible tells us what this God is like and the first thing it tells us about him is that he is invisible in John 1 18 it tells us that God is invisible uh, no man has seen God at any time the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So the fact that no man has seen God at any time, if you put that with 1 Timothy uh, 1.17, which again, and there's many scriptures, but uh, now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. So here is, here is the God of the Bible. So I'm going to try to just give you, when you walk out today, uh, I'll... I, I want you to just have a better understanding of what the Bible says about God, all right? So the first thing about God is he's one, and the second thing about God is he is invisible. He is also in his essential being. Let's just, let's you and I do a little class here on Sunday morning. In his essential being, that is, as he is to himself, he is also unknowable. When you look at Luke 10, 22, um, it would tell us all things are delivered to me and my father and no man knoweth who the son is but the father and no man knoweth who the father is but the son and he to whom the son will reveal him. So no man knows who the father is. Now this verse goes further than I want to go at this time because it tells you how the father is revealed to us and the father is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. But what we want to get at this point is is that no man knows who the Father is. And there's no way to know who God is as Father of creation, progenitor of all things. There's no way to know that except that God would reveal himself, which introduces to us the whole subject of revelation. So if you were going to talk about a scientist this morning, they would tell you in the scientific method that you have to find God by observation. You have to see him. You have to be able to, to find him. But the, the Bible version is, is that because you're finite, you would never be able to see him because he's invisible and he's unknowable unless he reveals himself. And so the first great 
good news, unutterably, inexpressibly great good news is that God has chosen to reveal himself, to disclose himself to his own creation, which is you and I. And this is a great gift. He doesn't have to do that. He does, he's not required. There's nothing to require him. He is the infinite God, the only God. But <clears throat> he is also love. And so love goes out from itself. And so God goes out from himself in this self-disclosure, self-revelation. And he reveals himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, he would be unknowable. Now, God is not uh, some of this, I'm only saying, so that you can identify other groups that have non-biblical positions concerning God. God in his essential nature, next, is that God is immaterial. God is not made out of matter like, like fingernails and skin and flesh and, or wood or whatever. God is not made out of matter. John 4.24 tells us that God in his essential nature is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So immediately we see that all the pagan religions that worship trees and rocks and, and stars and their stores, I, I, I used to have a live talk program for an hour or two every day and it was on uh, not a whole lot of stations but there were several million people across America uh, that could hear it and uh, and people got into this pagan worship and into spirit channeling and guide, got to asking questions. So, you know, I had to dig a little bit because you're supposed to know the answers. And if you don't, you deflect them until you can go get them, then you answer it the next day. But anyway, um, uh, uh, so I, I, I went to, I don't recommend this. In fact, I, I would tell you not to do this. Um, I went to uh, an Earth Planet store which is a pagan store that is not far removed from witchcraft and which uh, sells books on channeling, which means a spirit gets a hold of someone and then people pay money to have that person talk to them. Some of these people become multimillionaires doing this. And, but also, I noticed in the store, because I had to get the books so I could read them so I could discount them because I knew they were wrong, but I wanted to be able to do it with uh, knowledge. So uh, they also had a lot of little rocks you could buy, shiny rocks. And uh, they were amulets, amulets. In other words, these rocks connect you to the spirit world some way. Um, and that you actually, I mean, you can, you know, you've heard people say talk to the hand. Well, you can talk to the rock. And, and um and if a rock's big enough, you might even worship, or you might worship a tree, and um, uh, or or you might worship a human being. Idolatry is when you make anything that is finite, when you give it infinite status, that is idolatry. I don't care if you worship a book. I don't care if you worship a tree. I don't care if you worship a person. This is why all leaders always have to be conscious of the fact that it is it, the, the only reason they draw people to themselves is to shift them off of themselves to Jesus Christ, to God. If you don't do that, then you become an idol and, you, and that becomes blasphemy and that becomes, a, that becomes a sacrilege. And so that deflection is critical. You have to lead, but you have to, you have to also do that. And, and so any any making of a finite object into worship is a form of idolatry. And, and so we don't do that. God is a spirit. Now you have religions that view God as being a human person. All the old Greek uh, mythology that I just talked about and don't want to get off in, it's a hodgepodge of stuff. But um, uh, some of that carries over into our day. Some people believe that God, is, when you see God, he is, he's a man with flesh like you and I. Mormonism teaches this. I'm not slapping the Mormons. I'm just telling you what they believe, and they're wrong. And, and, it's, and, and, it's, a, and, it's, a, and it's a serious mistake to think of God because their, their teaching of God, this is where some of the strong emphasis on family comes from in Mormonism, is that their teaching on God is that God became a God. He became a God. 
and, and that there's a long lineage of gods. And there's God and there's grandpa God and there's great grandpa God great 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 grandpa great 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 and so forth. And, but that's not true. That's not true. Amen. If you're Mormon here, I love you. I'm being gentle on purpose. I'm not trying to be offensive to you. I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just saying you're wrong. And you don't need to be a part of that false doctrine. You need to understand in John 4, 24 that God is a spirit. And they that worship him in spirit and truth, those are the ones that are the true worshipers. Amen. And until you see God in that, your perception, every false perception of God has ramifications that are negative. So I'm not going to unravel what every false doctrine about God leads to. Just, just know this morning that every false doctrine about God leads to to something negative in application to everyday life. And so, therefore, we need to just look at the Bible. Look, I'm not fighting with you. I'm not fighting with anybody. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So if you don't want to believe the Bible, this is America. I mean, in America, this is a great country. You can go to hell if you want to. I mean, the law doesn't tell you you can't go to hell. You know, it's a great country. But, but... By the same token, we also can look in the Bible and find out what it says. So we're just trying to look in the Bible this morning and find out what it says about these things. Uh, so God is not flesh and blood, Luke 24, 39. Uh, I don't know if I had that in the list of scriptures that I gave to the uh, uh, screen team this morning. But Luke 24, 39, I can't quote it to you, so I have to just kind of jag around here till they get it on the screen uh, because I've got it in my notes but I didn't write it out. So everybody said praise the Lord. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say I'm glad to be in the house of God. Luke 24 39. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. If we don't get it you can look at it when you get home. Okay. Praise God. All right. Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself and handle me and see. For a spirit. We already saw that God is a spirit. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. Okay? So the humanity of Jesus Christ that you saw was not the eternal part of Jesus Christ. It was the human part of Jesus Christ. He's saying, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. And we already saw that God is a spirit. All right? And also, you can look up the scripture later. I'll say it for the sake of the tape because some of you like to buy the CDs and take them home and and study them out, but Psalm uh, 139, 7 through 12 lets us know that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once, omni, everywhere at once, okay? Uh, he is also omniscient, knows all things, is all wise, all right? He is also omnipotent, omnipotent, all powerful. These are all basic biblical truths about God. And God is known as Father in two ways. Because you hear the Bible refer to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So when you refer to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the uh, 400s, um, the term Trinity came to try to describe Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It actually preceded that. But Augustine is the guy that really, what would you say, popularized the term. So when you think of God as Father, everything I've described so far is God as Father. He is the Father of creation. He is the progenitor of creation. He has made all things. He is the Father of the universe. And in all of these situations, you will find that he certainly merits the title of Father. When it comes to God disclosing himself, the very fact that he created is an expression of himself. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 that the invisible things of creation, they reveal, the visible things of creation reveal the invisible things of God, even his eternal Godhead. And so by looking at creation and admiring creation, we don't worship it, but it is a reflection of God, that God expresses himself because any, creativ any creativity is self-expression of whoever is doing the creating, whether it's a work of art, whether it's creation of a table or whatever. It is an expression of the creator. And so 
God has expressed himself by his actions. However, to know God personally, there is a self-revealing of the Father. And we see this probably the clearest scripture and one that is often turned to is John chapter 1 and verse 1, which introduces the term uh, word as a, a title for divinity. And in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, Genesis 1 and 1 says, get this, Genesis 1 and 1, which is, of course, the first verse of the Bible, says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But this says, in the beginning was the word and the word is with God and the word was God. Verse 2 says, the same as in the beginning with God. Now notice verse 3. All things were made by him, by the word, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so the way this invisible God did his creation that we find in Genesis 1-1 was through, for lack of a better term, through a medium of himself, through a form of himself, which is identified in the Bible as the word. The word word used in John 1 and 1 in Greek as many of you know is logos and logos means primarily thought expression or concept and so in the beginning was the thought expression or concept and the thought expression or concept was with God and the thought expression or concept was God so get this and it will help you I think that God thought of how to express himself and God had a concept of how to express himself and God had an expression of himself which was exactly what he thought and conceived and so he expressed himself that's why the word word is used in John 1 and 1 is that God self expressed himself God self-disclosed himself. There's nobody else to disclose him unless he discloses himself. And so this is what the term word is as it is used here. And then the word, if you look in John 1, 14, you find who the word was in flesh was Jesus Christ because it says uh, in 1, 14, it says, and the word was made flesh They'll catch up with me here in a minute, but uh, because I can't get all these in notes because once you get started, it doesn't always go down the same trail. So you just have to, everybody has to play catch up. But um, the word was made flesh, there it is, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Father is manifested him. That's what glory means. The Father is manifested here that the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. This is a staggering thought. This, folks, is the thought that elevates Christianity. It catapults Christianity into a whole nother dimension of richness from all other religions because of the staggering revelation that the God that is the creator, that is the invisible spirit, the essence of God which could never be known, that that very God expressed himself and became flesh and dwelt among us. The idea that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh is, an ex is the most extreme and profound revelation of hope for you and I. This is why no matter what your present status is, if you're going bankrupt, quit stressing out, quit killing over about it. If you've done your best, you've done your best. God has manifested himself in flesh and dwelt among us and gave us a chance to know him. And the opportunity to know him is so great that everything else grows strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And I feel his glory and grace here today. Let's love him together. Would you lift your hands and praise him? So, 
the Father is God invisible. The Son is God visible. 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us, without controversy, great is the ministry of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. A real hard and fast statement. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. This God that was manifest in the flesh was preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Now, we have, we have the account of when Jesus was received up into glory in Acts chapter 1. And so we know it's talking there about Jesus, that Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. This is why you can't say great men like Abraham Lincoln and like George Washington and like Muhammad and like Jesus. No. You can put everybody else in whatever category you want to, but Jesus is not a great man in anybody's category. Jesus is God, if you believe the Bible. If you don't, I mean, you know, I mean, that's your deal. But, but, but I do, and I, there's a lot of people here that do, amen? But Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Now, when you know that, then you, then you understand why, and we may get to this scripture or we may not, but then you understand why that there's no other way to come to God. And this is what Jesus said. He said there's no, we already looked at one scripture in Luke somewhere that said that, that the only way to know the Father is through the Son. And if you, don't, if you don't go through Jesus, you can't get to the Father. That's why Jesus says, I am, that's why we preach Jesus here. Because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And no man cometh to the Father except by me. It's not that he's being arrogant. It's that he is the only point in the universe, in the history of creation, at which the invisible God has penetrated the roof of finitude and punched through to where we can know that God. It's only in the person of Jesus Christ. that He is the revealer of that invisible God. And to have Jesus Christ in your life is like the unspeakable opportunity that no human being could ever merit but he has given it to us when you know Jesus Christ that you can't give him too much praise you can't love him too much you can't magnify him too much for his goodness to you and I let's praise him again right now amen and so Jesus is the eternal God the eternal word made flesh. And just to give you a couple scriptures, Colossians 1.15. <laughs> I know the screen team is pulling their hair out probably because I'm just not following uh, what I gave them at all. But Colossians 1.15 tells us that he is the express image of the invisible God um, as does Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 also reveals that to us. And <clears throat> Um, and he, that he is the only way to know the Father. I want to put these scriptures in here for the, you that want to go home and study this further. Luke 10, 22 and John 14, 6. Both tell us that he is the only way to the Father. That's why the, if you're a sinner here today, we love you. All of us are sinners. The only difference between you and me is we're saved by grace and it's not anything that, that we're any better than anybody else. It's just, but you can have it too. It's the gift of God. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. But... That's why, that's why the church is so critical, and that's why it's so critical for the church to do its best to be a medium through by which people can know the Lord. If you get Colossians 1.15, I want it. Um, that's why it's so important because Jesus is our only hope. I mean, that's what this church preaches. I mean, because that's what, as you can see, what the Bible says. And so... I mean, I can go to school the rest of my life. I've, I don't want to. I've been to enough school. But, but I've, I've, I, could, I can read every book there is. I can make all the money in the world. I can, whatever people can do to try to elevate themselves above the, the effect of everyday common life that finally ends up in the casket, none of it can get me to that God except Jesus. There it is because Jesus is this is talking about Jesus. You can read the rest of the passage when you get home. But who is the image of the invisible God? The image of the invisible God. Think about that. He is the expression of that God. Look in Hebrews chapter 1. And 
this is talking about Jesus also, and it tells us God who at sundry times and in many divers means diverse manners uh, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. It hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made, there it is again, by whom also he made the worlds. You say, well, well, was a father and a son back there? Well, sonship actually begins at Bethlehem. But before, get this, before, back to the verse before, before, before Jesus was son, Jesus was word. There is no other expression of the invisible God except Jesus Christ. Before he was son, he was word. He was God made visible before he was God made human. Amen. And so only in Jesus can a person know him. So by whom also he made the worlds. And verse 3 says, who being, notice this language, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. He is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Right hand means in the place of authority. And so the only place you can see God manifesting his authority in the earth is through, or in the universe, is through Jesus Christ. Are you glad for Jesus this morning? Amen. Amen. So uh, this is... This is who Jesus is. He's the expression of the invisible God. Aren't you glad you know him? Amen. And there are many scriptures about this. Um, let's look at Isaiah 9 and 6, and then I'm going to give another one, Micah 5 and 2, so that they can be looking them up while, uh, while I'm setting it up here for them. Okay? We're talking about who Jesus Christ really is. And when we look at him, I, I couldn't possibly get to all of the scriptures this morning. Uh, but here's Isaiah 9 and 6, which was written some 600 years before Jesus was born. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Here's who Jesus would be called. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Now we've already seen how he was the Mighty God. He's the Mighty God expressed, made manifest, disclosed, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. So somebody says, when I get to heaven, will I see the Father? Yes. How am I going to see the Father? In Jesus Christ. Because that's the only way you can see the Father, because the Father is spirit and will forever be everywhere at once. But he has disclosed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So when you get to heaven and see Jesus, you can say, I see the mighty God. I see the everlasting Father. Now, I gave you another one, but go to Revelation 1 and 8. I see the mighty God in Jesus Christ, and I see the everlasting Father. And here's what Jesus says after he was resurrected and ascended into heaven. This is Jesus talking in Revelation 1 and 8. I am Alpha and Omega. That's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And look at verse 11. This is Jesus talking. He says that he is the Almighty, not one of the mighties. It's not like there's a big fight in heaven, but a family fight between dad and son to see who's the Almighty. No. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, not the second. He's the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and so forth. So Jesus is the first and the last. He is God made knowable, which is why you and I need Jesus Christ, because there's no other way to know God, because he is God manifested in the flesh. Let me just give you a couple more scriptures. If I already gave you another one, you can put it up there. I don't know what it would have been. Uh, I've already moved on, but it'll work. But just throw anything up there. It'll work. We'll make it work. Uh, uh, also, we look at Colossians 2 and 9. Uh, if you run out of scriptures, 
to look at. Everybody said, God bless the beautiful screen team. You can do better than that. I mean, even if you don't think they're beautiful, they're beautiful for what they're doing this morning. Oh, God, don't be so judgmental about these people. Praise God. Okay. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now, this is talking about Jesus. Is The man Jesus is given a name which is above every name. But he says, John 5, 43, before we get to Colossians 2, <laughs> I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. That's talking about the Antichrist, by the way. People are going to accept the Antichrist who comes in his own name. But he said, I am come in my Father's name. And so it's not like Jesus is introducing a new God to the world. He is introducing the God of Deuteronomy 6.4 in a personal and knowable way in his own person. And what did I say? Colossians 2 and 9. Did we already? Yeah. For in him... Speaking of Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, what that tells me is, is when you and I get to heaven, the only way we're going to see God is in the person of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the Father made visible. Jesus Christ is God made visible. His humanity is his sonship. And so it's not like there's two people up there, like, like Father God long gray beard, sunny God, short, brown beard, and Holy Ghost God, cloud, no beard. That's not how it's going to be. That's, that's not what it amounts to. These terms are used because you are dealing with a, a, an overarching subject that challenges the ability of human language. I don't care what language you speak. We're doing English this morning. But it challenges the ability of language to try to articulate this because... Because language is finite, anything finite is subject to categories, limitations, okay? But what we're dealing with here is a God who is infinite. He is not subject to limitation. So already you will notice that we've used terms, what they would call negative terms, to describe God. He is unboundaried. He is unlimited. He is, because we don't have a word that can describe what it means to be unlimited, because everything we know is limited. And so we have to just say he's unlimited. And that's as far. We can't go behind what the mind can conceive. And that's as far as the human mind can go. Everybody got that? Said amen. Amen. And so we are attempting to describe that which, is, which defies human language. Amen. And so you have the Father is God in his essential nature and his essence as spirit. The Son is that God revealed or disclosed the word made flesh so that we know him. It's not like another God. It's not like there's two conscious, consciousnesses. Two consciousnesses. That's a hard word to say. Two consciousnesses in the Godhead. Jesus was human and then there is divine consciousness. Now, I, I, I uh, was acquainted with um, a debate between two Catholic priests. One of them said, is there more than one consciousness in the Godhead, or is there only one consciousness in the Godhead? And one of the Catholic priests said, there are three consciousnesses in the Godhead, and the other one said, there's only one consciousness in the Godhead. And so, obviously, they had a dilemma, and they were caught on the horns of the dilemma. Well, I will tell you there is only one divine consciousness because there is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Are you glad you know him? Amen. Amen. So then you have the term the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So the, and, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm working this down. Some of you who are who stayed up late last night, you bloodshot eyes, you're comatose. I'll try not to say anything that will disturb you right now. God be with you till we meet again. And 
let you continue your rest while the rest of us study the Word of God. Amen. So, so what is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost of the Holy Spirit is, the, uh, is that same God that is indwelling us. Some places it's called the Spirit of God. Some places it's called the Spirit of Christ. And some places it's called the Holy Spirit. And the terms are used in Scripture interchangeably. But there is not more than one Spirit. There's only one Spirit. God is a spirit. And 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, <clears throat> reiterates this. So when you pray, it's like I had a woman one time ask, uh, because she was going to a church that was confusing her when they talked about the Godhead. They were confusing her that she needed to pray so many minutes a day to the Father and so many minutes a day to the Son and so many minutes a day to the Holy Spirit. You know, I've got enough lists in my life without having to make divine lists. And check out the list. How okay, Father? I've only given you five minutes, and I gave the Son ten. Well, I got enough things to repent of without adding that to the list. And so, uh, uh, I, I tried to explain to her that uh, that when you pray to Jesus, you are praying to the Father made knowable through the person of Jesus Christ. You just pray to Him. And when you pray to him, you have prayed to God because that is the only point that God can be known. And so when the spirit of Jesus comes inside of you, the Holy Spirit, it is called the spirit of Jesus. Did I just give you a scripture? What was I talking about? Okay, throw it up there, whatever it is. Just anytime you get one that looks good, throw it up there. We'll make it work. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether it be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So it's not like you get the spirit of Jesus and then later you get the spirit of the spirit or the, or the Holy Spirit and then somewhere in there you may get the Father. No, when you get the spirit of Jesus, you got the Holy Spirit. For by, where'd it go? For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Look at the last line. And have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now there's, there's numerous verses which reiterate that there's only one spirit. And there's verses which reiterate that that one spirit is, the, let's just get it. The spirit of God, Romans 8 and 9, uh, identifies the Holy Spirit as the spirit of God. Uh, but, uh, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now look at this verse. You're in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. And then he uses this interchangeably. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the terminology is used interchangeably here that it is obviously the same spirit because by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And it's only by that one spirit, the self-same spirit. Look at 2 Corinthians uh, 3.17, and, and it just simply corroborates this. And then last, or close to last, maybe I'll think of something else, but we'll look at Acts 16 and 7. But uh, 2 Corinthians, whatever I said, 3.17, is talking about the spirit of the Lord, and it says, now the Lord is that spirit. Jesus is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. One translation says, and where the spirit is Lord, there is liberty. Where the spirit is Lord, there is liberty. So, so Jesus is that spirit. In Acts 16 and 7, in the King James, this is how it reads in the King James. And after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. In the Greek, it clearly says, I don't think there's anybody that would disagree with this that knows the Greek, it clearly says, and they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus suffered them not. And if you look a verse or two above, it'll tell you that the Holy Ghost forbade them. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Jesus. 
that comes to us. And Jesus is the only point we can get to know God. This is why, this is why, just explaining to you that the Rock Church preaches the essentiality of receiving the Holy Ghost. This is why we put such heavy emphasis on that. We think that churches are cheating you. It's not like we're making it harder. It's like you're getting cheated when they say, oh, you don't have to receive the Holy Ghost. Have to receive the Holy Ghost. I get to receive the Holy Ghost because it's the spirit of the resurrected Christ. And I need the resurrection power inside of me. Don't give me this have to bit. I get to have the Holy Ghost. And it transforms me and makes a new creation out of me and ensures that I go up in the rapture because it's the spirit within me that's going to lift me out of here. If that same spirit which raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it's going to quicken your mortal body also. Oh, let's stand to our feet and clap our hands and thank God for the revelation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost this morning and what it means to you and I, what it means to have the Holy Ghost what it means to know him. Amen. Amen. Now, and so that's why the old songwriters, you know, when you hear some of these old songs, at first you can think that, well, uh, those old songwriters, man, they, what, what would make them write a song like that? But that's why some of those old songwriters wrote songs about, uh, in earlier Christianity, about the revelation of God. Did you know, did you know, that recently, what was it, in the last two or three years, they discovered the oldest church, Christian church, that's ever been found. And they found it under a prison where they were doing excavations for a new room or new dorm or something for the prison in Israel. And they found it in the valley of Megiddo. And the floor of this church was in pristine condition. It was made out of tile, little Roman tiles, little bitty, what do you call them? Mosaic. And um, now they found other old churches, but, but this church, they said, goes back to probably 100 that century A.D. The Apostle John, most people believe, wrote the book of Revelation in 90 A.D. So this church was either existing at the time of John or shortly thereafter, just 10, 20 years later, whatever. On the floor of that church, it has a little dedication. I don't remember all the words, but I remember this. It says something about we dedicate this to Jesus, the God. If you want to know what they believed way back there, then you go way back. You go to the Bible, and then you have archaeology where they had no hesitation to say we dedicate this to Jesus, the God. Not a God, not one of a bunch of gods. Jesus, those people had a revelation of what we're preaching this morning. They understood this today. Amen. Aren't you glad for the revelation? Oh, my Lord, and what it means to know Jesus Christ. What it means to have the Holy Ghost. What it means to walk according to his word. I don't want nothing coming between me and Jesus. Amen. Because he's all I need because it's, because it's, because it's all in him. It's all because in it's him. The fullness of the Godhead. It's all in him. Can you sing it? It's all in him. It's all in him. The mighty God is Jesus. And it's all oh, in let's him. Sing it. It's all in him. Oh, it's, it's all, all
mighty God is Jesus. Prince of Peace is he. The everlasting Father, the King eternally. The wonderful in wisdom, by whom all things were made. The fullness of the Godhead in Jesus is displayed. Oh, it's all in him. It's all in him. explains why the Rock Church baptizes everybody in the name of Jesus Christ. We don't baptize people in the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As far as we're concerned, that'd be like me writing you a million dollar check and then signing it, Father. It's useless. The authority is in the name. The authority is in the name. He signed his name in blood. Amen. And the Bible in baptism says you're buried with him. Singular. Him. Romans chapter 6. We're buried with him in baptism. Amen. That's why I'm not ashamed of his name because Acts 4.12 says there's none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. That's where it's at. And all the family of heaven and earth is named after the name of Jesus. Now we just can't think of anything better. If you, if you want to go beyond the name of Jesus, then, you know, again, you could do what you want. But, but we don't want to go beyond the name of Jesus because there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. I, I'm, I mean, what, what badge of honor could I have more than to bear the name of Jesus? Because it's all in here. 